So yeah, like, hey everyone, I'm, I'm Kenneth. Um, I'm originally from Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, I recently took a little rocket or a plane and moved to Canada. And I work for this tiny little company called Microsoft. And what I do at Microsoft is really all about dev tools. So I'm, I'm a program manager, so that means I do product strategy, I do a lot of prototyping, I'm working closely with my engineers to, to basically figure out like, what the dev tools of the future should be. And I think personally, I spent the past many years in the community doing a lot of dev tools kind of hacking, and then this year I joined Microsoft to do it uh, as a full-time paid job. And I think we as developers, it's like we really care about the tools we use each uh, and every day. So I'm basically here to talk about how we think about the future for, for dev tools and how we think about we can maybe do things a bit in a different way. But first, I would like to provide a bit of context um, on the web platform and, and how we need to think about dev tools uh, going forward. So I think it's pretty clear for all of us that we all, we all web developers, we're all using JavaScript, and, but the web platform has changed quite significantly uh, over the past, I would say, five years. Like, when I started building for the web, it was all about documents, doing simple text documents. Um, that was basically like, that's why we have hypertext markup language to do a scientific report. We had a CSS, so we could style the documents. But if you actually look at like how the majority of us are using the web platform and the browser today, it's all about applications. This is just animated GIF of like Netflix that the majority of America is using each and every day, uh, which is actually quite a complicated application when you think about it. And even if you look at the devices we're using each and every day, they've also changed. Um, I remember like the good old workstation Mac or like uh, the, the, the good old laptop. I had plenty of these little, little Lenovo guys over the years. So like, if you look at the devices we're using today, they, at least for Microsoft, they look quite a bit different. We have like Surface Studio, it's all about a touch surface. We have surfaces, if you use a MacBook, if you use an iPad. The devices are, has changed quite fundamentally from being this workstation kind of thing to something that's a bit more mobile. And, and, and really, when we talk about the, what devices people are using to browse the web, it's really about mobile devices. And like today, mobile phones and, 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 and large phones, tablets kind of thing, comes in in a lot of different sizes. And there's been a lot of stuff happening in terms of, I remember my good old Nokia 3210 that where I could play Snake to like my, my, my iPhone 7 I'm using today, right? So our, the, our, the mobile devices has changed quite a bit too. And even the browsers all of us are using every day, our customers are using every day, has changed. Like today we have like Chrome as a market leader. We actually have Safari, uh, uh, has with, if we include like uh, iPads as a pretty significant desktop market share because the iPads are grown so big today. Um, and then we have like, if you look at our market share, like for Microsoft, our Edge market share is still growing. Uh, we're still trying to kill the remaining bits of IE, uh, but one day I'm sure we will succeed. Um, so like the, this desktop landscape has changed quite a bit. And, and I just want to touch upon, like, I'm, I, I'm on the Edge DevTools team, and as a part of a new ef our effort of, of actually reinvesting uh, in the web, then we decided to kill IE. We're doing Edge. And that was basically because what Microsoft did previously was basically just mic dropping out of the, the, the stage after doing IE 6 because that was an awesome browser, uh, at least back then. Um, but we're basically reinventing or trying to reinvent uh, our approach to, to, uh, to how we build for the web. Um, and m another interesting thing, if you look at like our devices has changed, our browsers we use each every day has changed, but also internet adoption has changed. Um, like now, I know now we'll be in Singapore, uh, but, but when I show this in, in the Western world, uh, people are amazed that there are more people living inside the circle uh, than outside of it. This just so, shows something about uh, how the next billion will go online, and what markets are better relevant, and what kind of devices people are using when they go online. And we need to think about this when we build our websites, when we optimize our user experiences, but also when we build our tools. And it's just another interesting fact that I think many people tend to forget, is like there's more people online in China than there's population in Europe. It's a mind-boggling number when you think of it, but people forget. And to me, that's just interesting because it shows a lot of opportunity, uh, but it also tells me that we ne maybe need to rethink uh, our approach to, uh, to, to dev tools. And I just want to quote Benedict uh, Evans here. It's like, saying mobile internet is the same as saying color TV. It's kind of implied when you watch TV today that it's in color. 
And kind of when you go online today, it's kind of implied that you do it from your mobile phone or you do it for, from a wearable. Like, this mobile thing is just the way we do things. Um, and when we think about mobile, the mobile landscape has also changed quite a bit. Um, actually, if you look at like overall market shares, UC browsers more popular uh, than Safari Mobile. That's almost 18% of the global market share. We are still seeing a significant chunk of, of Android, uh, the stock Android browser on all the Android phones. We are seeing new browsers like the purple one that is Samsung Internet, growing th th triple-digit uh, market shares every, every month because it's now the new default browser on Samsung devices. So we're basically seeing a whole shift here from traditional browsers to new players that are entering the market. We're also seeing uh, players like Brave and Yandex actually gaining pretty good market shares. So the more interesting thing is we as, we as front-end engineers or VIP developers, what we care about is like the, the, the engine that we need to target. And we're seeing like U, uh, U3 engine actually being larger than Safari, but most of us don't know how you, you see browsers working on the inside because it's a proprietary VIPkit fork. No one has access to it. And that's interesting. And then we have like the, the good old players like VIPkit, we have Blink, HTML, our engine, we have Gecko. Um, but we also see like new browsers coming around like Brave that is just using whatever engine that is available on the underlying platform. So when you use Brave on Windows, is right now it's an Ele Electron app. If you use it on your iPhone, it's using VipKit. Uh, if you're using it on an all Android device, it's using Android browser. So it's kind of just switching the uh, underlying engine uh, when it's relevant. And to me, that's interesting, because this shows that, that, that the web world and we have gained so much compatibility that just doing the engine itself is no longer a competitive advantage. But this also changes our perspective when we build stuff for the web. And then we are seeing all of this, uh, the, the, this whole trend of, uh, of the progressive web. And, and we, like, my bet here is that in a few years, you, end users and, and you as a developer won't know that you're using a browser anymore. Because what we are already seeing on, on mobile platforms is the VIP being embedded inside native. We see that on Android with Chrome custom tabs. This is a Pinterest app that can just embed like an advanced VIP view inside the native shell. And we're seeing it on iOS 2 with Safari uh, view controllers. Um, so we're seeing this full emergence of like native platforms and the web melting together in this combined experience. And on a desktop, we're seeing the web used as a, as a runtime too. So we see that in, in Slack, that's just an Electron app. At Microsoft, we see Visual Studio Code, our open source editor. It's just a web app shipped inside Electron. Um, so we're basically seeing the web being, being merged into all of the different uh, categories of apps we use from our mobile phones to our desktops. And that's really exciting because that means we can ship more as web developers. Um, and then we have this whole progressive web app movement where, where suddenly uh, you can go to a URL and the website can be, be promoted to your home screen um, and live outside of the, the regular browser UI and the browser Chrome which I find really interesting. And that's some of the things that, 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 that we at Microsoft are spending a lot of time looking at. So right now, we have service worker fetch, cache, push, uh, and bib manifest all in development in Edge. And the reason for this is because we want to bring the progressive bib to the desktop. Uh, we have still have quite a significant chunk of users using uh, uh, our, our platforms, and especially using desktops. And right now, we find it rather silly that you have to install an Electron app. Uh, and it's a kind of a, a clunky experience. What if the, the desktop experience could just be you go to Netflix and suddenly it's on, on, on your desktop? But it prompts a lot of interesting questions because what is a home screen on a desktop? How does all these things work? What if you open up the desktop browser and you go to Netflix? Should it open up the PVA you have on your desktop, or should you stay inside the browser? There's a lot of interesting challenges with that, but we're working hard on, on trying to crack this knot because we think that's the way uh, and that is the future for the web. And another interesting thing, when we look at all this change, new devices, new platforms, new rendering engines, we're also seeing this next paradigm shift uh, that is going to happen. It's basically WebAssembly. So all major browser renders are shipping at least an experimental implementation of, of WebAssembly that basically allows any native developer to take their C++ code, compile it via MScript or something uh, that can generate VASM code and run it inside the browser. That is being, that uh, WebAssembly code, VASM code is being uh, run by the JavaScript engine and then ultimately is re being rendered by a WebGL. And this is like, an interesting challenge for a lot of us web developers because here there's no HTML or JavaScript involved anymore. It's just your native game that suddenly can run in the browser. And 
kind of my point here is that the front-end role is being redefined these years. Like, a lot of us, we care about HTML and JavaScript, but as the web and native melts together, and we're trying to bring more advanced capabilities into the platform, uh, front-end is being redefined. And a good example of this is, for example, my, my Android watch that can show push notifications. So I can get a push notification from Chrome running in a service worker that it was activated by a few lines of JavaScript. And the question I'm asking myself, are you a front-end developer if you write JavaScript in a service worker to show push notification that is rendered natively, no HTML, no CSS on your watch? Are you, are you a front-end developer because you just wrote a back-end integration, right? And I think that's, that's going to be an interesting challenge for us uh, when we think tooling, but also when we think our identity, because JavaScript or uh, uh, HTML and CSS might not be as relevant in the future as we think. And kind of my job at Microsoft is to, is to think about all these things and, and try to make sense of it and say, so how, how does DevTools fit into all this? And, and kind of when I look at like, the DevTools we are shipping today, they're all very similar. If you, if you look at like, uh, if you look at the DevTools we ship in, or we ship in Edge, like Google is shipping in Chrome, um, they all kind of, the same, kind of have the same functionality. And, and my point here is that I think our industry has a DevTools dogma. We kind of have this preconception that a div tool is something that is installed as a part of your desktop browser. It has to be docked at the bottom of your screen. It has to have like a DOM Explorer script tab, maybe a network tool, and then it's a div tool. And I'm, I'm, I'm really asking myself, like, is, is this really, is this, can, can we do better here? Because if I look at like, my, what my team did back in the good old days, like 2007, i.e. developer toolbar, yay. Um, and I look at like the tools we're shipping today, they, they're quite alike. The DOM Explorer, you can see like some, some style, but tech, theoretically, it's kind of the same tool. And if I look at like what Chrome is shipping, it's kind of the same from Edge Dev tools. They, they have the same kind of thing, like network sources. And like, I'm, I'm really asking myself, in a world where the web is running outside of the browser, running on a, a new range of devices, is this really the best we can do when we think about the whole development experience? Um, because if you try to break down like, the tools that all of us are shipping today, modern div tools are basically a collection of tools. It's a mini IDE that has a DOM Explorer console, debugger, network tool, performance profiler, maybe has some memory profiling, has some emulation features. It's actually a really complicated set of tools that all browsers are shipping. And yet again, they are like, at the bottom of our screens. They're basically in a fraction of our, of our screens. And we use them when we are debugging. So we sit in our editor, we open our dev tools, we need to debug something, and then we switch back to our authoring context. And basically, if you think about it, this is what we do all day long. We trap between debugging and authoring, debugging and authoring. And I'm just trying to say, like, is this really optimal when we actually think of it? Because if I look at the way workflow, like, it's completely broken because our authoring tools is not the same as our debugging tools. And if I actually look at like, the workflow, then this is still a typical development workflow. You open your editor, open your browser, you navigate to a page, you find the file in your editor, you make a, a change, you go back to your browser, refresh the page, you open the div tool, you go to the scripts tab, you find the same file you just edited, you go to the edited line, you set your breakpoint, you debug, you, you figure out what's wrong, you go back to your editor, you make a change, you tap back to, to the browser, and then you repeat this all day long unless you have installed like a gazillion of other tools that are running in like five different command lines and refreshing a lot of things for you. But this is still the de facto way that you're building for the web. And this was fine when the web was just about scientific documents, but when we're building applications, is this really good enough? And the funny thing here is like when I talk to developers, um, I, developers don't realize that this is a problem. They don't realize that we can do better as an industry. And I call this the VIP developer Stockholm syndrome, that we think is perfectly all right and it's perfectly okay the way we build for the web. And I think, I really think we as an industry, we can do better. And just a few thoughts here, like if you take a step back and look at our tools that all of us are using every day, why do I have to learn a new div tool for each browser? Why is that given in 2016? Why do I have to use different tools between authoring and debugging? Why is that still a thing? Why isn't my editor a bit more integrated with my browsers? And like, why are DevTools still bundled with our desktop browsers? It's not like you can open an iPhone app and open a DevTool on your iPhone or on your iPad. 
Why is DevTools still this thing we consider a mandatory part of the browser? And if you look at it, there's basically this massive disconnect between uh, the authoring side and the debugging side. And that's some of the things like we at Microsoft uh, over the past uh, months have spent some time trying to figure out if we can do better. Um, because the way we view about the tools, that we, we think that, that diff tools and editors are basically complementary to each other. They shouldn't replace each other, but they should have a way to work together somehow. Um, so that's basically what we've been spending a little time on trying to basically connect the two worlds and having a more integrated experience when you're building for the web because it's too goddamn complicated to build for the web these days. Um, so what if the workflow was more like you open your editor, you open your file, you make a change inside your editor, you open your browser, you, you set a breakpoint inside your editor, you debug it from your editor, you make a change, and you just see the browser update. What if you had this same experience where you're not forced to use a lot of different tools? So actually, back in March, we shipped like, something we call VS Code Chrome Debugger. And basically, what you're seeing here is basically an animated GIF of VS Code debugging Chrome. Um, so you can basically just say, press the debug button, and then VS Code connects to, to, to Chrome, and you can set your breakpoint straight from your editor. No need to leave the editor where you actually author and write the code. So this was like a first experiment we did, and it actually turned out that this is, is quite popular, because this is like the most popular extension we have for Visual Studio Code these days, because people love this integrated experience. So we thought, hey, like, we have our own browser. What can we do here? Um, so a few months later, we, we, we did a blog post, or I did a blog post where we announced that we have now integrated Edge with Sublime Text and Visual Studio Code, because developers kind of wanted the same integrated experience. And the way we did this was kind of in, in a new, I would say, non-Microsoft way, because we released a component called the Edge Diagnostics Adapter. Um, that is basically a little protocol adapter that enables uh, third-party tools to interface with Edge. But instead of inventing yet another API, a proprietary API, um, then we did this. Because if you look at like, modern dev tools, they're built upon something called remote debugging protocols. And tools like Visual Studio Code or Chrome Dev Tools or any other tool uh, were already integrating with the Chrome debugging protocol. Um, so we just wrote an adapter for Edge that implement the same API. So that way, then, we could enable uh, our existing debuggers for Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and other tools to just work with Edge out of the box. Um, and kind of the point I want to get through here is that we do support an open ecosystem where, where browser and tooling vendors uh, can work together. We don't want to like, en enable this closed ecosystem in this closed world where we try to force you to use one particular product. We want to enable as many tools working with our, our platform. And another interesting thing here um, uh, happened recently. That was basically an effort by Google is uh, Google committed a new project called V8 Inspector to Node. And that basically means that Node now has embraced the same uh, Chrome debugging protocol. So you can use Chrome DevTools, you can use Visual Studio Code uh, to debug Node because it's the same API. And this opens up some really interesting possibilities uh, that hasn't been possible before. Because uh, by having the same API uh, for both the client side and the back end side, the server side, uh, that means we can actually have simultaneous debugging. And I call this like the nirvana of debugging, because that basically means you can debug both parts of your application if you're a full stack developer, as many of us are today. Um, so I just want to show a quick demo on how, how that actually works. So what I have open here is Visual Studio Code. Is the text big, big enough? Should I zoom in? OK, I, I didn't hear any, anything, so I think it's OK. So basically, what I have here is, is a Visual Studio Code. I have a little node app using Express. What you guys can see here is I serve my, my bundled JavaScript allocation with Browserify. So it's just bundling my full uh, application and generating a source map. Um, and my, my, my uh, client-side application is just an Angular app. It can basically view like a, a time zone. I can see what time it is in Vancouver and what it is in Singapore. And that's about it. But the cool thing here is like, what I now can do is that I can just go to, to the debug uh, mode in Visual Studio Code and press debug. And what you are then seeing is like now I'm, I have a, the, the, uh, the debugger enabled. So if I go to my server side code here, I can set a breakpoint. I already set it. So if I refresh the page, what you're seeing here is that I'm now debugging my node code. I can step debug, I can continue. If I go down here, I have the full call stack of what's going on. I can go back in time and I can just say continue. That's, that's like cool because then you have visual, visual debugging uh, for Node. 
But one of the things that, that, that we just released, and that's a part of like uh, the insider build of Visual Studio Code, that's why the icon down here is green, is that we have uh, support for multi-target debugging. So what I can do while my, my, uh, my debugger is now attached to Node is that I can actually just select Chrome up here. And if I press uh, debug again, what you're seeing is that I have another instance of Chrome running. I'm now hitting the same server-side breakpoint because the page is loading. And then my application is open. But now what I can do is that I can just open up my client-side code. So I can go to a controller here. Let's just browse a bit around. On add new click, I want to set a breakpoint. And I want to see what happens here is that what you're seeing is that Chrome is now being paused because it's paused on Visual Studio Code. And I can do step debugging of what's happening in my client-side code. And what you see here is basically you have like both threads because the, our debug is connected to both parts of your application. And you can basically just continue to have a continuous debugging experience across runtimes and also across stacks. And I think this is like the first step we're taking on bringing a more simple workflow to your development workflow. Because you, why, would you why would you use a different tool uh, when you can just use the same uh, experience regardless of what you need to debug? And kind of the point here is that this is just Node and, and, and Chrome. Our architecture of uh, Visual Studio Code allows you to debug Edge with your, uh, with your Go backend because we have debuggers available for that. So we can provide this consistent experience across your stack. You could imagine that you're hitting an API that is running on your staging server. You could just configure the debugger to connect uh, to, to, to your staging server, which I find really, really cool. So another thing we did was basically we thought, OK, if, if the web is all about mobile devices, why don't we just enable debugging on iOS? So we did the same experience uh, where you can debug your iOS device from Visual Studio Code, same, same integrated experience. But the key thing here is that this was actually the first time if you were a Windows user that you, you could debug iOS from your Windows machine. Before we released this, you, go, you had to go out and buy a, a Mac or Mac Mini just to debug uh, your iOS device. That's no longer needed. And it's the same concept. Again, we use our same debugger, we use the same API, and then we use a, a, a protocol adapter to enable iOS devices to work with our stuff. And a thing I, I want to touch upon here is like, when, when we think about it, it's like now we have like a more integrated web development workflow where we can try to avoid a lot of different tools uh, as a part of our stack. But why is the web one of the few platforms that still bundles a full development environment with the runtime? I can't, if I you know, do an Android app or do a native C++ app on my desktop, there's no full ID included as a part of my application. It's not a part that the user can hit like F12 and suddenly they, they, they see a magic editor, right? Because if you look at what, what end users are experiencing, normal web users are confused. This is a screenshot. Uh, of, of a confused user uh, that talks about like child abuse and like it's really being uh, feeling confused and the point of this is because of this it's because there's a warning message saying here force all of his children to be wrapped in a block <laughs> <laughs> and like it makes sense like tool box for development contains an inline span child what the heck is that right and like I imagine that the, the, that you are a regular web user and you just by mistake press inspect element open this then like cyber attack, what's going on here, right? This is really crazy. And the, the, the thing is, like, this is Firefox. This is from our bug track on Edge. Like, normal VIP users don't know what inspect element is. Here, there's a person that has played a Facebook game and suddenly clicked inspect element, and now the dev tool has been open for three days. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, they don't know what's going on, right? Um, which is, which is kind of scary because to us as developers, it's the most natural thing in the world. And if you open up Chrome DevTools and you go to Facebook or any Google property, you're basically seeing the same, that normal web users are hacking themselves. So Facebook is forced to like, add this massive like, console warning. This is a browser feature intended for developers. Don't copy-paste stuff in here because apparently people are copy-pasting we had JavaScript in here to get more friends or a bit more likes or whatever, right? But to me, like, when we look at this holistically, this is kind of a problem for the web platform, that users of the web are basically hacking themselves or feeling, uh, feeling scared, right? So um, we released a blog post, I think it was like yesterday or the day before, uh, because uh, in the Edge team, we've been, been looking at our, our rel relatively simple telemetry we have for Edge DevTools. 
And uh, this is a graph that shows the dis distribution on, on basically how long, how many seconds people are using uh, our tool. And we basically saw that the majority of our users of SDF tools are opening the tools, clicking a bit around, and then closing it within 15 seconds. And we basically have seen this as an indicator of people are opening the div tools by mistake. Um, because we, we also can, we can see like if people click inside the tool and people open it, have it open for maybe six, six seconds, and then they find the close button and they close it again. They're really confused about this thing. And this makes sense when you think about it, because Edge, at least right now, is mainly an end user browser. Not a lot of developers are using it because our compel compatibility are great. But that basically meant that we looked at this data, and as a part of our last release we, we, we shipped a few months ago, we decided to hide HTTP tools by default. So all the developer options like view source and inspect element are now hidden, because regular users don't care about these things. They just want to go to Netflix or go to Facebook. Um, and yet again, we are trying to balance, balance like the user experience. Um, so you can go to About Flags, and you can it, like, enable it here and say, you want to show view source and inspect element in the context menu, click it, and you have it again, just like Safari. But we also have kept in the, the desktop shortcut, so if you press F12 or press something, that can open the div tools, and we re-enable the mode again. But we're basically like doing this as an experiment and looking at the data uh, and then re-evaluating it. And like, I would love to hear your feedback in terms of like, if this is confusing for you as a developer. But we're basically just trying to shield end users as much as possible for these really powerful tools. And I just want to, when I, I, I don't have like an answer to, to do this question, but why are DevTools still, still bundled with our browsers? If you look at all the change that is happening to the web, it's about applications. The, the web is now running in PWAs without any browser Chrome. The web is running inside Electron shells on your desktop. Basically, the browser Chrome, the address bar, the refresh button, all these things are now gone. And if you look at like the devices people are, are the next billion are going to experience the web at, it's going to be non-desktop devices. It's going to be mobile phones. It's going to be uh, new kind of variables, hololenses, kind of new experiences that doesn't have the traditional keyboard and mouse. And then yet again, we as an industry, we insist on shipping the div tool use each and every day to debug uh, all, all of these other devices in a desktop browser uh, and bundle it at the bottom percent of your screen. For example, if you want to debug Samsung Internet, uh, I am not aware that Samsung is shipping a desktop browser, right? So maybe we need to take a step back and enable the div tools to work out of the desktop context and maybe work with some of these new device factors in the future. And really, when I think about the future of div tools, is looking rather complicated because the future of div tools is basically going to be a bunch of different tools. We as Microsoft, we will probably continue to ship Edge Div Tools, we will probably continue to ship Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. But what we imagine is basically a world where these different tools are more integrated. Because you as a BIP developer, you should have the choice if you want to use Edge Div Tools or Chrome Div Tools with our browser. And we already enabled that. And the world is also going to be that you, need to, you want to have your favorite editor. That could be Atom, that could be Vim, or whatever. But that needs to be more integrated with the runtimes. And game developers, when, when they need to publish their, their games, like, we cannot force them into Edge Div Tools or Chrome Div Tools and say, you need to debug your Bipper Simply game in this bottom percent of your screen. They will probably prefer to sit inside the editor where they wrote the code. Um, so we need to enable all of these tools to, to work with all the runtimes. And if you look at the runtimes, the runtimes are going to be much more complicated because there's Samsung Internet, Internet there's UC Browser, there's Edge, uh, Safari, there's a whole new range of devices. There's probably going to be like five different varieties, variants of Electron uh, or web runtimes you need to target. So these tools need to be able to work with a broad set of runtimes before you as a developer can be successful and productive. And then if you look at the devices that, that, uh, that these tools, uh, 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 these browsers or runtimes are running on, it's going to be a broad range of devices. Um, if you are sitting here in Singapore and you need to roll out in India, maybe you need access to devices that you cannot buy here in Singapore because they use a different set of hardware. So I also imagine a future where we have device clouds, where you can say, I want to roll out in Indonesia, give me the five uh, most used devices, and then you get them screencasts to you or something like that. We need to solve this because availability of low-end, high-end uh, hardware is a problem for, for all of us, regardless of where we are in the world. So I imagine that you can use SDF tools to, to debug Safari Internet, or Samsung Internet, and you can uh, have the, your code running on a stream device coming from the cloud. I think this is the direction we need to go 
uh, go towards to enable you as, as, and us as developers to be much more uh, successful. And as the VIP grows out of the browser, which is happening these days as the whole progressive uh, VIP movement, we need to reimagine uh, our dev tools. Um, and at Microsoft, we're spending a lot of time trying to figure this out. And as of a few weeks ago, we decided to scale up our, our Edge DevTools quite significantly. So if you're interested in trying to help out and build the future of DevTools, like check out this URL. And by that, I'm 20 seconds over time. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And if you're interested, <laughs> tag along on Twitter. Um, and let's, uh, let's build the, the future DevTools together. Thanks. Yes.